Thank you. We're, we're going to do a quick uh, chair switch here or, or have our, uh, our next group of speakers come up. We're going to use you guys in the panel, so maybe the additional speakers can add on at the end. And in the next section, uh, before we get into our uh, discussion, we are going to have uh, three presenters who are going to talk about incentives for data sharing, so really building upon some of the things that, uh, that Dr. Goodman started with. And our first uh, presenter will be uh, Peter Dashi from uh, John Hopkins School of Medicine. And, uh, and Peter will be talking from the academic perspective of some of the incentives to uh, share data. Thank you uh, very much for the invitation to be at what I think is one of the most important meetings we're having uh, in the last few years on this topic. Um, in terms of cultures, what I'm going to be describing, I hope, will give you a sense of the gulf between the worlds of academia on one hand and industry and regulators on the other through the lens of their understanding about different types of data, different types of documents. So I want to focus on the question of what does it take to credibly evaluate trials. Let's start with a typical question. Does drug X reduce the chances of horrible outcome Y? Now I could look at case reports, I could look at case series, could look at observational studies even, but I decide that since there are randomized controlled studies that address this particular question, that's where I want to look. And so I'm searching across the ocean here for balls. And each ball represents a clinical trial. The red balls are negative trials. Drug didn't work. Green balls, positive trials. Drug worked. Now I could look only at the green balls, could pool them together, but that would be a little biased. So I decide that I want to look at all the balls to be as unbiased as possible. Now, how many of you think that's a good idea? Look at all the balls. Minority? No, majority. Okay, good. But it turns out that there's more balls than appear at first sight. Many trials are unpublished, below the water line, and largely out of sight. This is the problem that we know when we call publication bias. Luckily, we've made pretty good progress in this area with registration initiatives like clinicaltrials.gov, although that's still limited to newer trials. But we can now at least, at least identify some balls that are under the surface. However, addressing publication bias retains a fundamental assumption that obtaining a trial, a publication, is the goal. We in academia for years have been calling publications trials. The publication is the trial. This is what clinical practice guideline writers, systematic reviewers, WHO, CDC, and many others have been doing, going around and collecting journal publications for all the trials they could find. But what has over the last few years become a matter of growing concern is the fact that the publication is not the trial. Each trial, as everybody in this room now knows very well, and we've discussed, contains a myriad of documents and types of data. Things like case report forms, things like individual participant data, IPD, internal documents like marketing assessments, investigators' brochures, emails, meeting minutes, this, and the case, and the uh, clinical study report, a CSR, which itself contains many elements like the protocol, the statistical analysis plan, sample case report forms, and so on. Now, all along, people likely had some sense that such documents existed. But how many of us have actually seen these and actually read these? Could I have a show of hands of the people who've actually read a clinical study report? 15, 20? Here's my question. Are any of these documents, or perhaps all of them, needed to credibly assess trials? If all we have is a journal paper, this means that we're putting our entire trust that everything we need to know about the clinical trial is accurately reflected and fits in the 10-page document up at top. That little guy above the waterline. Now, this illustration, unfortunately, could only fit so much. So here's a longer list of all the kinds of documents mostly produced by a trial sponsor that exist, particularly for industry-sponsored trials. And so I'm going to lead you through some of these documents showing examples and continually asking this question, do we need this type of data to credibly assess a trial? Also keep in the back of your mind that data are not just numbers. 
Sure, measurements are a key part of data, but data can mean analyses, and they can also mean narratives, both written narratives, as in what happened to a particular patient, but also correspondence with trialists. My argument is that we need all three, and in great detail, to fully understand a trial. So let's start off with a clinical study report, and thank, thanks, uh, Dr. Eichler, for this report. This is for one trial of Tamiflu, and it's 8,545 pages, and don't worry, I printed double-sided. <laughs> Here's the corresponding publication. Seven pages. Now, I'm sure you're all thinking that there's no way on earth anybody would read 8,545 pages. Is that what you meant when you raised your hand? No. Okay. So you'd be right. If we look at how a clinical study report is actually laid out, and this is the table of contents from one, we find that it's a highly structured and well-organized document. The first 233 pages of this particular one tells us basically what you, find, you would find in a journal article, but it's a big journal article, 233 pages. Background, methods, results, discussion. That's what got compressed to seven, maybe. The next 190 pages gives us supporting trial documents, such as the protocol, blank case report form, statistical analysis plan, and certificates of analysis. The remainder 8,000 pages at the bottom is mostly an archival print copy of individual participant data. Protocols show us how the trial was to be run and how data was to be collected. They provide far more detail than a method section in a journal article. This is from another example from the New England Journal website where the protocol is posted, journal article, methods in the article, two pages, protocol 121 pages. Protocols are so long, in fact, that they need their own table of contents. Protocols can also include pre-specified statistical uh, tests in a section called the statistical analysis plan. And they be, may be in both the narrative form as well as in including statistical code that will be used to analyze the trial results. Access to study protocols help reduce the possibility of reporting biases. It's an original study protocol that allowed investigators of the class study published in JAMA to know that the, the trial in JAMA had been misreported, and it misreported the original protocol, statistical analysis plan, the trial duration, and conclusions, including the key claim that Celebrex was safer than alternative treatments. Protocol amendments are just as important as the original protocol. In the protocol I just showed you a minute ago from the New England Journal website, it turns out that the authors had only posted version 6 of the protocol. Included in version 6 is a compressed list of changes, amendments that were made to prior versions. The amendments show that one of the pre-specified out efficacy outcomes was altered three years into the duration of the trial. This is not mentioned in the journal publication. Clinical study report may also contain certificates of analysis, which are an authenticated document certifying the constituents, quality, and purity of the products that are being tested. In this example, we have a record of the appearance of Tamiflu and placebo capsules. The Tamiflu capsule, as you can see in what's blown up here, versus the placebo capsule. The Tamiflu capsule had a light yellow cap, but the placebo had an ivory-colored cap. These details are neither present in the journal publication here, nor are they present in the body text of the clinical study report, both of which call the placebo matching. Now, we've talked much about individual patient data, IPD, up to this point in the, in the conference. And IPD is commonly believed to allow for the verification and reproduction of trial results, as well as enabling additional analyses. But there is a basic assumption here that IPD is trustworthy. Please recall that it's because it is the case re report forms created before the trial begins and a blank copy of which are included in clinical study reports on which the actual patient data are collected. And sometimes the IPD computerized database 
does not reflect what is recorded in the case report forms. So this example I have here comes from an FDA medical officer who reviewed the Avandia record trial. And he found that although the patient, you can see here, is recorded to have a heart, had, a, had a myocardial infarction, uh, the, that was never referred for adjudication and so simply disappeared from the so-called raw data that is the IPD. To credibly assess trials, we might need to look beyond what people typically consider data and into more narrative forms of documentation. How about marketing assessments? Swarup Vejla, who I see in the back, is, uh, has shown that before embarking on trials, Park Davis conducted what, what they call marketing assessments to determine whether the company would aim for producing a journal article, what they call a publication strategy at the end of the road, or a submission to a regulator for an, an additional indication, what they call the indication strategy. In this case, Park Davis chose the publication strategy and decided they would publish the trial if the results were positive. Well, why might this matter for a doctor or patient analyzing this trial? Well, if it's known at the outset of a trial that no regulator will be scrutinizing the data, there's less of an incentive to make sure the trial is conducted to the highest possible standards. I'm not saying this occurred in this particular case, only that there's less of an incentive by virtue of the fact that the trial appears to have occurred with the assumption that nobody else would be able to scrutinize the data. What about correspondence? Joe Ross, who's also here, and colleagues, looked at the internal correspondence to the STEPS trial of Neurontin. They encountered a letter from the clinical research organization uh, conducting the study written to Park Davis informing the sponsor of numerous problems with the data. The CRO uh, noted to them that investigators are inexperienced with conducting the trials, that they do not have study coordinators, and that training for completing the case report forms was minimal. The lesson here is that it's not measurements taken within the trial that tip us off to these problems, but a letter written about the trial which allows us to understand that data quality may be severely deficient in this trial. CSRs, yesterday we had a comment about CSRs, that CSRs may be a good first low-hanging fruit in terms of data sharing. And I think this is an important and imp a good suggestion for the initial step. In fact, there's, there's a really good reason for doing this. They already exist. They're already complete for almost all of these trials. And this, was, this uh, sentiment was echoed recently in JAMA in an editorial by Rodwin and Abramson. They noted, ag again, that drug manufacturers already produce these reports. And importantly, that making these CSRs publicly available, and I would annotate here making full clinical study reports publicly available, would not be expensive, yet disclosure would promote research integrity, medical knowledge, and public health. In a way, though, it really shouldn't be a plea or a dream about what we can do in the future. The experiment has already begun, as I hope you got from the first talk this morning. Since late 2010, the European Medicines Agency revised their access to data policy. Doc it's actually access to documents, any documents they hold. Uh, policy, and they've released, it's reported, 1.5 million pages of clinical trial data. For our particular Cochrane review, we, re we received 25,000 pages, including that 8,000 page report I showed you. I'd like to know, put out there for discussion, FDA's position on non-disclosure today when the same data, the same drugs, the same clinical study reports are being released in Europe. But EMA does not have all the data, such as case report forms for all patients, nor do they have all the drugs that we're swallowing. Yeah. And so I end with the question that I've been repeating all along. What is or are data? 
and what types do we need to credibly assess a trial? Are we going to settle for polished 10-page journal articles? Or do we need to start thinking about the real universe of trial evidence? Thank you. Thank you, Peter.